Welcome back to Law and Crime Live, everybody. We're keeping a close eye on the courtroom in Wisconsin, the George Birch case. We're looking for that live feed. We expect it at 9.30 a.m. today. Now, we know the defense will probably be calling one more witness. The state will probably put forward a few more rebuttal witnesses, most likely to uh, contradict the testimony of George Birch, the defendant in this case. And then they're going to be closing arguments. So as this case wraps up, we definitely have a lot to cover, and we're carefully monitoring the feed. And as soon as we do have that live feed we're going to make sure to go to it today but right now i want to bring in my guest attorney and long crime trial analyst david Icebrook. david it's great to see you good morning jesse great to be here again great to see you because we have so much to talk about let's start from a little bit broad you heard george birch testify was there anything in his testimony that you said hmm some of that seems credible or do you just feel you know what this is he's completely making this up i'll tell you something when you listen to him on direct when he told the story of meeting the girl meeting nicole with the bar flirting drinking, her getting in his car, driving back first to his place, and then couldn't hang out there because, you know, one of his roommates uh, was in pajamas or something, and then had to find a different location. All of that, you know, sounded relatively logical. Mm -hmm. A guy meets a girl at a bar, you know, tries to hit on her. She's receptive. They go to try to find a place, and he said he was hoping to have sex. And during his direct, you can think, yeah, most of this could happen, to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Here's the problem that I have, and I want to get right into it. What about, again, we know that George Birch is on trial for the murder of Nicole Vanderheiden. We know that he's pointing the finger at Douglas Dietrich, her boyfriend. He claims that Douglas knocked him out, even though it's not entirely clear he was knocked out, and forced him at gunpoint to get rid of her body. Oh, and let's not forget, while he was knocked out, whatever this period of time was, Douglas was the one that killed Nicole. He woke up, George said he woke up, and her face was all bloody. What evidence do we have that corroborates any of that part that Douglas was with him? We have zero. As I said, you asked the first question, does any of his testimony sound plausible? And I said on direct it sounds plausible. Once Cross started, you realize that his story was falling apart. He had no corroboration. He had no proof that the boyfriend was there. He had no proof that he was knocked out. He, you know, no, no um, injuries to his head, no bruises, no bleeding, no nothing. So he had the fact that the GPS was locating his phone and had his four locations. He then had to back a story into those locations. Because here's the problem. He says he was knocked out. So if he was hit over the head, to such a period of time that a murder occurred, and we know that she suffered blunt force trauma to the head and strangulation, that takes time. I don't care how long that, that takes a minute, two minutes, whatever. You're knocked out for that period of time, you don't have a bump on your head. Okay, fine. If Douglas Dietrich is the one that is holding you at gunpoint, and you are driving Nicole's body while Douglas is in the back seat, how come the Fitbit data, which was introduced earlier in the week, wouldn't record these steps? And then we talked about in the break, he might have taken the Fitbit off and then put it back on in the middle of the night? Well, if I was a defense attorney on cross, when I was crossing the expert, the Fitbit expert, I would have drilled at that point because the Fitbit expert was talking about how they could track the steps and all the devices and, and the mechanics and the technology and how they track his steps and where he would have gone and how many steps he took. And I believe he testified he only took 12 steps. My question to the expert would have been all... Assuming that's all true, had he taken the Fitbit off, would it also register any steps? Of course, the expert would have said no. So at least you're building, you know, in this, in this scheme of things, at least you're building an explanation for the jurors that, okay, possibly we can get around the Fitbit had the boyfriend taken the Fitbit off. Right. The defense attorney really did not drill that point much at all. But once you start taking big country, that's George Birch, that's what his name he's been known since he was six years old, big country, six, seven um, foot um, gentleman, once you look at his story piece by piece, bit by bit, none of it makes sense. And well, I'll, I'll get back to that. Well, talking about his story, we want to replay pretty much uh, the main points of his testimony. We played for you earlier when he first met Nicole. Now let's listen in to when he started to fool around with her. And this is when things take a very interesting turn. We'll play it for you right now. Um, into the back seat. But you said you went around to which, which door, I guess? The back passenger. And is that the door that would have been closest, one of the doors that was closest to the curb? Yes, sir. Did you get into the car at that point? 
um, for a few minutes. So when you got in the car then, was she, where was she? She would have been scooted over more towards the center slash driver's, rear driver's side. <clears throat> what happened once you got in the car? Um, the things we were doing before kind of continued and uh, I guess you could say escalated. When you went to the back seat, when you got out of the car and went around, were your clothes on? I did not have my shirt on, but I had a tank top undershirt and my shorts For anyone on. joining us, that's George Birch, a man who was charged with the murder of a young mother, 31-year-old Nicole Vanderheiden, explaining what happened that night, that he had sex with Nicole in the back seat of a car outside of her own home, and then he was hit over the head by her boyfriend and forced at gunpoint to dispose of her body that the boyfriend killed. Now, again, I'm here with David Icebrook. David, we're... Okay, we talked about it, all right? This is where the, the more of the unbelievable part of the story comes about. And we heard the prosecutor really coming hammering in on this point. You're going to have sex out in the street, her on the passenger side seat, you're standing on the outside, you're butt naked. Wouldn't she just tell the babysitter to go home? Because that's where the reason they didn't go into the house. Well, there's two stories that he gave about why they couldn't go back to her house. First, in the bar, she explained that she had... Um, young children and mm -hmm. the first explanation was that um, they were out of town and then when they went to the house the babysitter was there and I believe on cross they brought out well didn't they first tell you that the babysitter why would the babysitter be there if the kids are out of town and he sort of like you know didn't address that too well or he didn't want to explain that but why he described himself outside the car like that is bizarre the positioning is bizarre and again he's backing into a story to match the GPS tracking of the phone and to match the fact that if his back is to the house, he could get knocked in the head and he wouldn't have known it would have happened. So it's interesting to see. Well, that. It, was, it was dark. The assailant was hooded. Yep. Um, there could have been more questions, I think, by um, the prosecutor to try to describe the assailant. Even though he was hooded, he never asked him how tall he was. Right. You know, he, this, the uh, Birch is 6'7". And, and, and that's the question. We have to talk about Douglas Dietrich because that is the man that is identified as the defense as the one who really did this. We are going through George Birch's testimony. We expect live testimony at 9.30. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Stay tuned. Welcome back, everybody. We're covering the George Birch case out of Wisconsin. We're keeping a careful eye on the courtroom right now. We expect live testimony about 10, 15 minutes or so. As soon as we have it, we'll make sure to go to it. But we are talking about the George Birch case because yesterday, George Birch, the defendant, the man charged with first-degree intentional homicide, took the stand and explained his story. And what he, we've been talking about so far is that he met the victim, Nicole Vanderheiden. According to him, he met the victim in a bar, was flirting with her, wanted to have sex with her, brought her back to her house, outside of her house, couldn't go inside because her kids and the babysitter were there. So he was beginning to have sex with her outside when he gets hit on the head and sort of gets knocked out. I want to play for you right now his testimony about what happened when he woke up. Let's listen to him. Did you do any of those things? Um, I, I didn't think that it was, I would be able, honestly, to be able to do any of these things without being harmed. So when you were instructed to go to the rear of the vehicle, you did what you were told? Yes, sir. Can you describe that for us? What do you mean? I'm sorry. So you were, I think you said, lane kind of by the, the open passenger door in the mid of the vehicle right. when you came to? And is that where you were when you were instructed to move towards the rear of the vehicle? I had um, I had stood up, but I was pretty much in that same area, yes, sir. So you did start to walk towards the rear of the vehicle? Yes, sir. I uh, started looking, kind of looked back at, at the individual um, and he motioned for me to move towards the back of the vehicle. Um, the whole time, he still had the, the firearm pointing in my direction. Did he move at all? He moved, as I moved this way, he also moved to keep the distance away, from the same, pretty much the same distance, but he moved at an angle as I moved away. So again, you were using your hands there. My understanding is you were moving towards the rear of the vehicle. He was moving towards the rear of the vehicle with you, but the way your hands made it seem, he was slightly further. At an angle ahead of me, right, and, and, and kept the same distance away from me as I was moving away. So that individual is 
doing that, and you walk towards the rear of the vehicle? Yes, sir. What happened next? Um, I, looking in my surroundings, um, and, and we're towards the end edge of the vehicle, back towards the rear of the, the by the bumper area or that vicinity of the car. That's when I kind of noticed my surroundings. You're watching the testimony right there of George Birch, the defendant in this case, explaining what happened. He was having sex with the victim outside of her home, and he gets knocked out when he comes to, or I should say knocked out, when he comes no, comes to, there's a gun being pointed in his face by a hooded figure. I'm here with uh, attorney and long crime trial analyst David Icebrook. David, how much of that is if people say he's making up that story, the little details matter, though, right? Those little details, some people say, how can someone make up little details like that? Well, first of all, he's had a couple of years to go over the scenario in his head. So he's been planning this scenario for the last two years. But I think equally important is on the prosecution's cross, he didn't go back over these details. That's when you want to ask the questions again to Birch and go over the nuances of everything he said. You want to create inconsistencies. So basically, exactly what you were just saying, he had you know each detail laid out. The prosecutor on cross really didn't go after those inconsistencies or try to have him describe things at all. Well, speaking of details, I have a clip right now of when George Birch explained when he saw Nicole bloody and battered. Let's take a look, and those are the details that are worth listening to. No, sir. Wasn't partially on the curb? No, sir. She was completely in the street at that point. Yes, sir. She was close to the curb, but she wasn't actually on the curb. She was in the street. Do you remember if she was face up or face down? If I remember correctly, um, she was kind of like laying on her side um, with her head toward the vehicle and her feet away from the vehicle. So her feet were, I guess, pointed down Berkeley Road in the direction that you had come from? Yes, sir. <clears throat> Mr. Bruce, you seemed to indicate she was laying at, her face was on its left side? Um, she was laying, her left side was up. Go ahead, Attorney Stebbins. What did you do when you came across that? Um, at first, I didn't know what to do, honestly. Um, it kind of put some things in perspective, I guess, a little bit of exactly what was going on now, definitely. Um, but it kind of freaked me out even farther when seeing this, because she was literally, from what I remember the last time, she was, we were in the car having sex. And the next thing I know, she's literally laying on the concrete right in front of me. It's best you can keep keep walking us through that. I mean, what happened after you came across um, that? The, the next thing I remember um, was the, the person behind me had, had been saying George Birch explaining when he saw Nicole dead. Now let's listen in to what he was instructed to do next. Then what happened? Um, I was pretty much obstructed to or told to pick her up. Did you? Reluctantly, yes. Will you describe how you picked her up? Um, I had to somewhat kneel down. Um, I I slid my arms under her, under her, her front half, and then slid my other arms under under her legs and kind of stood up with her in my arms. At this point, 
Were you able to tell whether she was alive or dead? It. I wasn't certain, but um, it definitely didn't didn't look like she was. There was no. Th this whole time, I hadn't seen any movement at all, or anything that would make me think that she was, you know, alive. I didn't hear any noises or anything like that. So once you you picked her up, what happened? Um, I was instructed to carry her and put her in the vehicle. This other person that you've been describing, where was he at this point? Standing behind me, um, like I said, a little ways away from me, um, the firearm still in his hands, um, pointing in my direction, telling me what to do, but he was off at an angle behind me. Every time I moved, he moved, but kept his same distance away from me. But pretty much almost mirrored what I was doing. He was right along with me. So did, did you put her in the, in the, in the vehicle? Um, eventually, yes, sir. Where? The, I can't, had to come up and I had put her like sat her in the rear passenger side with the door because the, the door was open. I uh, put her in there and then I, I <coughs> top half in and then I moved her legs and feet. That's the defendant George Birch testifying yesterday. We are waiting for a live feed back in that Wisconsin courtroom. We're monitoring very carefully. I see it right now. People are entering into the courtroom. As soon as the trial begins, we'll make sure to go to it. Again, I'm here with David Icebrook. David, what I think is interesting about this is it explains why the DNA is all, his DNA is all on her. I mean, he had sex with her, he moved her body. But what the, under cross-examination, what the uh, state really pointed, the fact was, you're going to tell me that Douglas Dietrich, a man you don't even know, is going to enlist you to get rid of this body? Common sense. Some of it doesn't make sense. I think the, the larger picture here is, first you have to realize that it's highly unusual for a defendant to take the stand in his own trial. So they had to balance whether allowing the evidence to come in regarding the DNA, regarding the tracking of the telephone, of the cell phone, and let that be unspoken on the defense and let this come into prosecutor or have the defendant take a stand and come up with a story. Now, what's also worth noting is it's unethical for the defense attorney to put his, his client on the stand if he knows he's going to lie. So this is a story that the defendant presumably was giving to his attorneys for the last two years. Mm -hmm. And he was going to go up there and let his client tell his story. It's a gamble. It, he, the weighing the fact that he's going to testify versus let this evidence come in without any, anybody refuting it. Well, I will tell you, I've spoken to people who listened, watched him, the whole testimony, and said, you know what, I'm not convinced he did it. There's something about his speech, there's something about his demeanor that says, I don't think he's a killer. Reasonable doubt again, and all you do have to do is get the one juror on the reasonable doubt, and that's why he's taking the stand. Be honest with you, after the prosecution rest the other day, I had my doubts on reasonable. I was questioning reasonable doubt myself. I thought he had a good chance of acquittal. After this testimony, I'm not so sure. You think he didn't do that well? I, I did not think he did so well, and on a cross, I think what's going to kill him is when the prosecutor asked him specifically the question of after you escaped, which I know we didn't get there yet on the clips, after you escaped, why didn't you call the police? Why didn't you contact anyone? I think that's going to be the toughest question for the jurors to answer. And there were many reasons why he didn't do it. One, he said he was on probation, was afraid of getting in trouble. Two, he thought Dietrich would be arrested. He didn't matter. And three, it's just not something you do when you're in that neighborhood. You don't rat on people. His first answer was that where I come from, you don't rat on people. Bad things happen to people who rat. That was his first answer. Then the prosecution went back at him again on cross and said, Mr. Birch, are you asking the jury to believe that you didn't call the police because you were afraid of being a rat. Then he said, well, I'm also on probation for grand larceny. That opens up 
a new spectrum of his testimony. Now the jurors know he's a convicted felon. They obviously want to keep out the fact that he was acquitted of a murder 20 years ago, but now he had to admit, and another, again, another balancing act. Do you bring that out, weighed against the fact you stay quiet and you let the prosecution enter the DNA evidence of the forensic? So now he tried to rationalize why he didn't call the police by stating he's out on probation and breaking probation by being in the state of Wisconsin. Right. I mean, you're making some really good points here, and we have so much to analyze. We're going to play you George Birch's testimony throughout this morning uh, as we do wait for the live feed. I see George Birch in the courtroom. We're waiting for trial to start. As soon as it does, we'll make sure to go to it. We expect the case to wrap up today. So much to talk about with George Birch taking the stand. A lot at stake for this man and everyone involved. We'll take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back to Long Crime Live, everybody. We're covering the George Birch case out of Green Bay, Wisconsin. We're waiting for a live feed in the courtroom as the, as the case wraps up today. What we are playing for you right now is the testimony of the defendant who took the stand yesterday, George Birch, him describing the series of events that led him to where he is today. And he is blaming Douglas Dietrich, Nicole's boyfriend, as the person who committed this crime, not him. Now, where we are right now, he was having sex with Nicole outside of her house. He gets knocked in the head by who will later say was Douglas Dietrich, and he's forced at gunpoint to put Nicole's body in the back seat. Let's listen in about what happened next. <coughs> into a semi-sitting almost position. Okay. So you, you position her in there essentially in a way that, that someone would normally sit in that right. seat. What happened after that? Um, I was advised to shut the door, and then I was advised to go around behind the vehicle to, the, to, the, to my driver's door and to uh, ultimately get in the vehicle. Now, oh, George, you, you say you were advised um, by this individual. What was their demeanor like? Um, I, I would guess the best way to describe it would be threatening, um, like pretty much forceful, uh, letting me know that this is what I want you to do and you're going to do it. And in a way, I guess, would be the best way to put it. Was, was he loud? Um, wasn't extremely loud, um, but more of a... Uh, I guess maybe it was like a commanding tone. Um, like, let me know that he was speaking to me and what he... He meant everything that he was telling me to do. I believe you said you closed the door once Nicole was in the vehicle? On the passenger side, yes, sir. Do you remember if the window was down? Um, all of my windows were down. All? Okay. Uh, so is that front driver, front passenger, rear passenger, rear driver, those windows were down? Yes, sir. When you close the door, uh, I guess... Was Nicole, what ha did you notice anything when you closed the door? She um, kind of, I guess you could say, slouched a little bit more towards the, s she was sitting in the rear seat, but she didn't lean against the door. She actually leaned a little bit away from the door, I guess, like almost sliding to the, the left a little bit. <clears throat> and you said it. I guess what did what did you say happened after you closed the door? Um, I was pretty much instructed to go around the back of the vehicle, around to my driver's side. Okay, so now George Birch has placed the body in the car. What is going to happen next? What we're about to play you is when he identifies Douglas Dietrich, Nicole's boyfriend, as the one who was holding him at gunpoint. Let's listen in. At the right side, right right here, a little bit behind me to my. I guess that'd be five o'clock. So, not directly behind you, somewhat closer to the center of that back passenger seat or back seat. Um, a little bit over, not not center, but moved over a little bit. Yes, sir. What did you do once you were in the vehicle? I um, again 
kind of tried to wave. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're cutting out of that prior testimony because we have a live feed right now in the Wisconsin courtroom. Again, this is the case of George Birch. We believe that the defense will call one more witness. And uh, curious to hear what this next witness says. Again, as the defense puts on their case, we believe the prosecution will put on their own rebuttal witnesses. As the witness takes the stand, let's listen in. And we are I.O. Thank you. April, you may be seated. Again, you've heard what you have to do with the microphone. All right, uh, we're going to work on that feed right there. But before we do, I want to show, a again, go back to the testimony of George Birch, the defendant who took the stand yesterday. And now it becomes the, whether the jury believes him or not. Let's listen in. What options I had at, at this point, um, it's com completely kind of freaked out a little bit, didn't didn't know what was going to happen, didn't have any idea what the situation that was going on was going to entail. What options were you weighing at that point? Um, still um, was running an option, uh, trying to figure out what my options might be. Did you have an opportunity to ever see this individual's face? The first time that I saw the best physical image of this face was when I looked in my rearview mirror. And when was that? Um, when I first started driving. Because it's with once I started the vehicle, you have your interior lights and the interior lights were bright enough that I could actually see someone. And I could see it, the reflection in the mirror. Because I couldn't physically turn around and look at them. And again, at okay, so according to George Birch's testimony, Nicole's in the back seat, her dead body. He's driving with Douglas Dietrich at gunpoint in the back seat, driving him off to a field in an effort to dispose of the body. Let's listen in about what happened next. So you step out of the vehicle, he's back at, I think you said, 8 or 9 o'clock, takes a couple of steps back when you get out of the vehicle, then what happens? Um, I was told to pretty much um, reach in from the driver's side and um, grab Nicole and pretty much bring her out of the vehicle. You said you did that from the driver's side? I, I, I was in the driver passengers, driver's passengers, the back passenger side. You see what I'm saying? Um, driver's side, back passenger. Yes. So I was leaned in, and she was, by this time, she had, she had slumped over and was more like her top half was leaning towards the center of the, of the back rear seat. It was a, like a bench seat. So she was still mostly in the rear passenger seat where you had placed her before? Yes, sir. But she had become slumped over towards the center or the driver <coughs> side of the vehicle? Yes, sir. And you, you at that point removed her from the vehicle? It was somewhat difficult, but yes. And did you say you did that from the driver side of the vehicle? Yes. So you had to reach from the driver's side over to the passenger side of the vehicle? Um, right. Um, the vehicle's not a huge vehicle, um, but I leaned in the back door and reached over, and it's only a couple feet to, to rigidly be able to grab her. Why didn't you go around to the other side of the car? Um, that, was, that was where I was at, and that's where I was told to do it. How he explained, you know, told me to grab her right then and there. The, the rear door was still open, um, so I just reached in and grabbed her because he was standing towards the rear of the vehicle. You're watching the testimony of George Birch, the defendant, testifying on his own behalf in his own murder trial. Again, I'm here with David Icebrook. Um, question for you. As the defense closes out their case, the prosecution can call rebuttal witnesses. Do you think that they're going to have to call Douglas Dietrich to rebut what uh, 
um, George Birch said in his testimony from yesterday? Interesting question is what I was uh, discussing earlier. That's today. why I asked. Yeah. Um, I believe that they, they should. Whether they will or not is obviously up to the prosecution, but I'd like to see Dietrich up there refuting exactly what Birch said, that he had never seen this man before. He wasn't out there that night. He was sleeping. Um, when was the first time that he was aware of Birch? When was the last the first time he saw Birch's likeness? Um, I think Dietrich is important to call as a rebuttal witness, yes. Because now that he can talk about everything that George Birch just testified to. He can absolutely refute point by point, which is what I was hoping the prosecutor would have done on cross with Birch to try to poke holes in his story by going over and nuance by nuance. Because it seems that we have more questions than answers considering don't really know the evidence putting Dietrich there. And that's what we're talking about. So we are working on our feed right now in that Wisconsin courtroom. When we come back, we're going to hopefully go right into the courtroom as the defense closes out their case and the prosecution will call their rebuttal witnesses. Um, it should be noted, again, you are watching the case of George Burtz, a man charged with first degree intentional homicide in connection with the death of a 31-year-old mother. And her body was found three miles from her home. George Burtz's DNA was all over her. And we can know from his cell phone that he was in four key locations that night, including the crime scene. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go right into that courtroom. You do not want to miss anything. We'll be back in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. That's who we're talking about, Nicole Vanderheiden, the young 31-year-old mother who everybody said was such a great mother, a great person. She died tragically. And now the question becomes, who did this? Who killed her? Well, George Birch is on trial right now for her murder. But his defense team is claiming that it was Douglas Dietrich, Nicole's boyfriend, that he was the one that did it. We have a live feed in the courtroom right now, and April Renario, a criminal investigator, is on the stand talking about the Fitbit data, the same Fitbit data that the prosecution is trying to say exonerates Douglas Dietrich, that he was wearing one the night in question, and his steps don't match up to a person who killed Nicole. Well, we want to listen in right now live to this criminal investigator. Did you request or subpoena records from Fitbit to compare to the report that you provided here today? Not for myself. I had tried for Doug Dietrich and they wouldn't provide it without a search warrant and I can only do a subpoena. And you did not attempt to do that for your own device? I did not. I had already failed the one time. With respect to those photographs that you're being shown <laughs> earlier, is it 185 and 186? Yes. Can I take a look at those? Sure. You know where you located these on Doug Dietrich's phone? Um, in the images section of the extraction. Are you an expert in cell phone forensic downloads? I'm not. Um, in fact, have you done any forensic downloads on the cell phone yourself? I have not. How many times in your career have you reviewed forensic downloads on cell phones? Mm, quite a few. I would say maybe 20. Do you know in what specific section of images you located that? those images? It was just in the images section. How many other uh, mapped uh, cache images do you see, did you see in Doug Dietrich's cell phone? There were quite a few. There were about 1,800, weren't there? Not maps, no. There were about 1,800 images total. Of maps, there may have been less than 100. There were over 17,000 images. Oh, I'm sorry. Phone, I was... Correct? Yes, there were. And there were 1,800 cached images from Google Maps on Doug Dietrich's cell phone, correct? I guess I'm not aware of that. I do not know. There were a lot of cached images from Google Maps on Doug Dietrich's cell phone. There were quite a few. Some were images, some were actual, like, maps. Do you know how the Google Maps application works? Not necessarily. Do you know if the Google Map, Maps application caches every image of every search that you do when you have the app running? It might. I don't know. And you picked out the two images that you thought suited the needs of Mr. Birch in this case, did you not? Those were just two that I saw that did connect to this case, yes. And you have no date stamps for when those images were taken? No, I did attempt to find some, but I was unable to. <clears throat> because, in fact, they were just filled in with cached images from the Google Maps application among well over a thousand similar images. That could be. And you're aware that Doug Dietrich and his family are developers of real estate in this area, correct? Yes. You were asked to walk the East River Trail in this case, correct? I was. You were asked whether or not you were uh, you had reviewed the information in this case. You looked at cell phones. You've been part of this investigation from very early on in the case, correct? 
Um, yes, since after the preliminary hearing, but yes. You're not aware of any single witness statement that places Doug Dietry on the East River Trail, correct? Correct. Nobody saw him there, no surveillance camera observed him on the East River Trail, correct? Not that I know of. There's no physical evidence, DNA, blood of any type that ties Doug Dietry to the East River Trail? No, we were just looking at different routes. So this is something that's invented by the defense. Objection, uh, argument. Sustained. No further questions. Any redirect? Thank you, Judge. So you've heard all the testimony here in this case, and you yourself have now provided more testimony about what a FIPIT is than any state witness, correct? Objection, that's likewise argumentative. Um, sustained. When you were looking at Doug Dietry's phone extraction, were there, what was the tab, what was the file called when you looked at the, that section where you found those photos? Images. It was just under images. Were there images of Doug Dietry himself on there? Um, there were some, yes. Were there other just normal photos that you would see? Yes. And then of all those images, Doug Dietry had a photo of the field where Nicole's body was found, correct? I'm objecting, Your Honor. I, she's not in a position to classify that it is a photo of that field. She doesn't have the technical background to testify how that image got on that phone. There's over 17,000 images. She doesn't know how applications save and create images. She doesn't have the background to do that. Judge, she testified that, and this came from the state, it's under images. It's right under there. That's what she's testifying to, that it is under that framing of images on Doug Dietry's phone. She doesn't have the expertise, and neither does the court. It's an image of, of the field. Image, picture, I, I don't see this, the, the, the distinction. I'll overrule the objection. You found those photos, correct? Correct. And then again, there's no surveillance even available on the East River Trail that could have caught Doug Dietrich, correct? Not that I saw. Nothing further. Can you redirect the turn of the No, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Stepdown. All right, everybody. So that was a very important witness. That was Investigator April Renario. And what you just heard was about the images found on Doug Dietrich's cell phone. Now the question becomes, why would he have an image of the field where Nicole's body was ultimately found? That becomes the question. That's really what the defense wants to put in the minds of the uh, of the of the prosecute of the the jury. Again, I'm here with David Icebrook. David, what did you make of that testimony? Well, she was obviously a hired gun by the defense. She's been sitting at the defense table the entire trial. If I was a prosecutor, I would have liked to ask how much she's getting paid, how often she's testified in trials, how often she's testified regarding Fitbit testimony in the past, which obviously was most likely not. Um, in terms of the photographs, they're a developer. He had a reason either to take those photographs on his phone uh, because of his professional work, or perhaps it, he was just curious about the trial after he was released and Birch was arrested. So it should be noted also, we just heard, I uh, wanted to update our viewers, that the defense has rested their case. Now it becomes a question about whether or not the prosecution will put on some rebuttal witnesses. We expect that they do. Um, now, we talked about this earlier, the Fitbit data, right? So she wore it to test it out. And uh, actually, David, we're going to have to hold back. I think we have a live feed back in the courtroom, so let's listen in. <coughs> Mr. Franklin, good morning. You can come forward. Step to the witness stand. Madam Clerk will swear you in. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you that? Yes. Please state your full name and spell your last name. Uh, Daniel Allen Frankel. F-R-A-N-K-E-L. Thank you. Mr. Franklin, you can see it again. Just pull yourself close to that bar. That's actually the microphone. Okay. Then the attorney will see you whenever you're in. Mr. Franco, can you state for the record how you are employed? Um, I am employed from Progressive Insurance. And what is your role with Progressive Insurance? I am an application programmer lead for Progressive Insurance. Can you describe what an ap application programmer lead does? Um, an application programmer lead can have a variety of uh, duties, um, largely kind of overseeing 
um, specialty applications. In my case, um, I work in the snapshot area. How long have you been with Progressive? I've been with Progressive 20 years. And has uh, your current position, has that always been your position with Progressive? It has not. I have been in that position since March of 2010, so eight years, almost eight years. And what are your primary job duties with respect to your current role? Uh, my primary job duties are working with our physical snapshot device, um, working with our vendor, uh, which produces and supplies the device, uh, working with our business partners at Progressive uh, to ensure that the requirements uh, and functionality of the device are what Progressive wants. Um, I also work on designing and implementing and maintaining uh, the software. Okay, so this is a, a man from Progressive Insurance, the next rebuttal witness, the first rebuttal witness put on by the state after the defense has just rested their case. And very interesting case. You heard George Birch testify yesterday that Douglas Dietry was the one that actually killed Nicole Vanderheiden. And we're going to have to hear what the prosecution does next. Will they call Douglas back? We'll have to wait and see. We're on a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Law and Crime Live, everybody. And speaking of live, we have a live feed out of the Wisconsin courtroom. The George Birch case on the stand right now is Daniel Frankel from Progressive Insurance. He's an expert talking about the snapshot device that was placed in Nicole's car. Now, why that matters is it can tell whether or not her car was moved that night. This is a critical piece of evidence to determine what Douglas Dietrich was or was not doing in the night in question. But let's not forget, the defense is pointing the finger at him. So let's listen in live to this testimony. Of Progressive business? Yes. And do you believe, uh, based on your role with Progressive, that they are a truthful and accurate representation of the records from Progressive system? Yes. Okay, again, you're watching the testimony of Daniel Frankel, Progressive Insurance, determining whether or not Nicole's car moved. Now, that becomes an important question because if her car moved, and we know Nicole didn't use her car, then Doug used her car. And it raises a question about why would he be driving her car? when originally we didn't believe he was. Again, it becomes a question about his movements that night. His movements, that's what we keep tracking in this case. What was going on with his Fitbit? Did his Fitbit track his movements? David, what do you think about this, uh, about the device in her car tracking whether or not the car was moved? Well, this is a critical point uh, for the defense and the prosecution because it you know, puts another dent in the prosecution's case if it could be proven that the car was moved at any time and that's the only car that was accessible to him. Because remember, he drove to the bar he was drinking, Dietrich, and then he couldn't drive back home. He testified he left his car at the bar. So her car would have been at home if he moved for any reason. If he drove to find his girlfriend and Birch, he would have had to use her car. And so this expert is, is establishing whether that car was moved or not. So we know the defense rested, and the, we're talking about the rebuttal witnesses right now. Uh, we believe the state will be providing some more rebuttal witnesses. We talked about earlier about whether or not Douglas Dietrich will be recalled as a rebuttal witness to contradict or to fight against all the testimony that was brought forth by George Birch, a completely new narrative about what happened to Nicole Vanderheiden. I would think the prosecution, again, would want to um, call Dietrich um, as rebuttal witness, just for those jurors who have that doubt in, his, in their mind. And again, it's 12 jurors. They need a unanimous uh, verdict to convict. It's a, it's a high standard to, to pierce the reasonable doubt. And right now, I believe there are probably people on the jury that may believe Birch. Yeah, that, I, I, I don't disagree with you. I think there, there was a very good story. Speaking of stories, let's listen in live right now. The witness is back on the stand. We have a live feed. Let's go. Mr. Franklin, I'm showing you what's been marked as Exhibit 187. Can you review those documents? Yes. Okay. And uh, Mr. Frankel, what is Exhibit 187? Uh, 187 is a summary of trip data um, gathered by device serial number P236181M. Uh, and that is the device that was installed in the, the Buick Rendezvous with the VIN number that I referenced earlier? Yes. And what does that data say with respect to the activity of uh, that vehicle between May 15th and uh, May 20th of 2016? Uh, the data shows that the vehicle was driven um, a number of times uh, between May 15th and May 20th. 
Is there any data for that vehicle after May 20th of 2016? There is no driving data here after 52016 uh, at 1251 p.m. And again, the, the request was made for data through May 23rd of 2016, correct? Correct. And there's no data after May 20th of 2016 because based on that device's recording, there is no recorded activity after May 20th, 2016, correct? There is no recorded activity after May 20th. In addition, you are aware that there was a second subpoena that was sent uh, requesting specific information about um, the device being uh, connected or disconnected uh, during a relevant time frame, and the request for the, uh, for the disconnect information was May 20th, 2016 through June 30th of 2016. Is that correct? Correct. And uh, you're aware that Progressive did provide records responsive to that request? Yes. In fact, you were the individual who cert certified the authenticity of those records? That is correct. And uh, these are the types of records that are maintained in the regular course of progressive business? Correct. May I look at one, Mr. Frankel, can I look at uh, Exhibit 187? Yes, sir. Well, you just heard it and the jury just heard it. Nicole's car didn't move. There was no recorded driving data after May 20th. Now, if her car didn't move, then that kind of defeats the defense's theory or at least putting in the idea in the minds of the, uh, the jury that Douglas Dietrich, her boyfriend, may have used her car in connection with the murder. So now we see them reviewing the exhibits right there, and this is an important witness, an important rebuttal witness for the state. Again, they tried to introduce this evidence earlier when they had Sergeant Slinger on, but he's not an expert in this snapshot device that records the movement of a car. So that's why they had to bring in this expert, this expert from Progressive Insurance. Um, again, you're watching a live feed. This is into Green Bay, Wisconsin. George Birch, the defendant, is on trial for the murder of Nicole Vanderheiden, and his defense team is pointing the finger at Nicole's boyfriend. We kept talking about it earlier this morning that really what the defense is doing is pointing the finger because of what George Birch's testimony was from yesterday. You heard it. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but we have the live feed back in the courtroom, so let's listen in. Event records, um, those show when the device has read uh, the VIN uh, off the vehicle, as well as um, connection and disconnection uh, from power. And on the last page of those records, there is an entry from May 20th of 2016 at 12.21 p.m. and another entry at, uh, actually there's an event time from May 20th, 2016 at 12.21 p.m., is that correct? Correct. And what is that entry? Uh, that entry is reading the protocol VIN um, the VIN number from the vehicle. Uh, indicates that it is connected at that time? Yes. And when is the next date that that device was disconnected from the vehicle? According to our data, the device was disconnected at 425 a.m. on um, June 1st, 2016. If the device had been disconnected from the vehicle prior to June 1st of 2016 at 425 a.m., would that information have been logged? That information would be logged. And even if the vehicle was powered down at that time, uh, in between May 20th, 2016 and June 1st of 2016, would it have logged retroactively that it had been unplugged from the vehicle? Yes, the, the device holds a timer of when it is active. And then if it loses power, it knows the latest date that it had power um, so that when it's plugged in again, then it can generate the, the disconnection record. So based on these records, the device was plugged into the vehicle on May 20th of 2016 and remained plugged in until June 1st of 2016, correct? According to these records, correct. And in summation on the previous records, you indicated that the last time that that vehicle was operated <coughs> uh, within the relevant time frame was May 20th of 2016. Correct. And the vehicle was not operated on May 21st of 2016. According to the data, no. Thank you. No further questions. I would move for admission of the exhibits, Your Honor. Subject to cross, any objections to 187 and 188? No, Judge. 187 and 188 are received. Cross-examination. Judge, may I just briefly look at the most recent exhibit before I begin questioning? 
Go right ahead. I think Mr. Frankel has it. I've just been provided a copy. All right. State. Again, Daniel Frankel from Progressive Insurance. Nicole Vanderheiden's car did not move after May 20th, 2016. Okay, David, we're listening to this. We've, we're listening to how important this piece of evidence is. I still can't track Douglas Dietrich's movements as said by George Birch, that he was the one by gunpoint orchestrating this whole thing. If any of the jurors believe George Birch, if they buy into his story, this testimony is irrelevant. They're not going to care what this guy says. Have you seen your experience just the testimony of a witness, a defendant in this case, whether or not it's backed up by evidence, whatever. That's enough to convince at least one juror that he might not have done it. Again, it's not very common that a defense, a defendant in a criminal trial takes the stand. You're rolling big dice here. Um, he almost got trapped, but he was fortunate that um, there was some testimony he mentioned about not being versed with a gun. And at that point, I thought they were going to possibly bring in his prior acquittal. Yeah. All right, we have a live feed. Let's go back in. Relies on cell signals. Correct. And cell signals sometimes weaken? They do. Sometimes they go out completely? That is correct. And if that were the case, then the snapshot device could not be communicating, I guess, transportation logs to progressive. Uh, the device <laughs> holds on to the data um, so that if it can't communicate, it will try a certain number of times and then it will hold on to that data until it's next appropriate time to call. And so the next appropriate time to call, that would be the next time that the device is used? We do have uh, check-in calls that the device does. Um, there are also calls where the device, um, it can go into a low, low power mode, um, so not to, to drain a battery. Uh, so it does that after a 24 hour period. <coughs> and then at a five-day interval, the device checks in. So, so say for example, um, in this specific case, the snapshot device is registering activity on the vehicle on May, May 20th of 2016, that's correct, right? Correct. If the cellular signal, I guess, weakened or went out during that time frame, hypothetically, it would not be able to, at that moment, communicate the information to progressive correct and then if the device is never used again or never activated again that would never be I guess back welcome back everybody we are watching the testimony of Daniel Franco progressive insurance now being pressed under cross-examination but whether that snapshot snapshot device excuse me in Nicole's car was actually reliable I want to say so long to my guest for this morning he's been great uh, you know David uh, you've been really good explaining this case from all different angles but I'd like your final thoughts about as the conclusion of this case comes about and they will provide their closing arguments today what is the defense and the prosecution really need to do if you could sum it up pretty quickly um, prosecution really needs to emphasize the point there's no corroboration to his story at all it's an unbelievable story it's a remarkable story that he only made up to fit the science and the forensics in the case um, the defense just has to keep poking a couple of holes for reasonable doubt, convince one or two jurors, maybe a hung jury. Very well said. David Eisbrook, everybody, thank you so much for joining us Thanks again, us today. Jesse. Great being here. Great having you. All right, everybody, so when we come back, we're going to go back into the courtroom as the prosecution and the defense wind down their case, and then it'll be up to the jury after all this long weeks of trial. We're going to cover it. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. Stay tuned.